If you were a security guard at an abandoned pizzeria where every night four possessed animatronic characters were trying to stuff you into one of their suits, what would you do? These Chuck E. Cheese knockoffs are hiding a dark secret, and if you don't watch out, then you could be next on the menu. Get ready for the moment we've all been waiting for since the bite of 87, because we're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the bloodthirsty animatronics in Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> This guy is about to take the most terrifying job of his entire career. Mike Schmidt is a down-on-his-luck mall security guard who lives with his younger sister, Abby, and spends his days doing his best just to make ends meet. One day, he spots this young boy being pulled away by an older man and immediately goes into defense mode, tackling the guy straight into the fountain and punching his lights out. Well, it turns out that they were actually father and son, and what started out as a simple misunderstanding that went too far ends up costing Mike his job. This leads him to a career counselor's office, but the man isn't too crazy about his prospects of finding another gig. After thinking it over for a while, he says there is one job that might be a good fit a night shift security guard at a rundown pizzeria. Although the pay and the hours are terrible, Mike here is just desperate enough to consider it, except for one problem. He refuses to work nights. Now there's a reason why Mike doesn't want to work the graveyard shift, and it's not because he's afraid of the dark. While he and his family were on a camping trip many years ago, his younger brother Garrett was taken by a kidnapper. Neither his brother nor the man was ever found, and so every night, Mike relives the moment in his dreams, desperately searching for any clues as to who was responsible. Without a job, things aren't looking too great for Mike here. Facing eviction and a battle for custody over Abby against his greedy Aunt Jane, he decides to call the counselor back and finally take the job, but that was his biggest mistake. He'll be working at a place called Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, a former children's entertainment center that once held parties hosted by its four animatronic mascots, Bonnie, Foxy, Chica, and of course, Freddy himself. The place was popular with families back in the 80s, but these days, its doors are permanently closed, although the owner still refuses to tear it down. According to the counselor, all that Mike here has to do is keep the local troublemakers from breaking in, but it won't be long before he finds out what's really hiding behind the curtain. Okay, Mikey here really needs to be careful. I get that the job market can be tough, especially when his most recent work experience ended with him beating the absolute snot out of an innocent customer. And we've all been in a position where you have to take whatever work that you can get just for a paycheck. But blindly taking a security gig at an abandoned family fun center is exactly how you end up getting your frontal lobe bitten out by an animatronic fox. Plus, nothing good ever happens during the graveyard shift, which you can probably guess by the name. This counselor here waited until he was absolutely sure that Mike had no chance of finding a job anywhere else before offering him this one. And if we've learned anything from watching Squid Game, it's that you never want to take a deal from a person who knows that you have no other options. He doesn't realize it yet, but this guy is leading him straight into a death trap, and it's time for Mike to start picking up on the red flags here before things go horribly wrong. Before accepting the job, Mike should look into the restaurant's history to find out why it closed down, and try to get into contact with any former employees from the place if he can. With such a high turnover rate, there are bound to be some disgruntled former workers who would give him the dirt on what's really going on behind those closed doors. And if not, then it would be an early warning sign that nobody has ever lived long enough to tell the tale. He could even search up the place's history online or head down to the local library to see if they had any old newspapers in the archives that might give him more of a heads up about the restaurant's dark past. Us FNAF fans already know where this is going, but it won't be long before he finds out exactly why none of the security guards who take the job end up sticking around. And the truth is going to be more horrifying than he could ever expect.
In the security room, Mike finds a VHS tape with his name written on the side. It's an old training video from back in the day explaining that the animatronics are able to move freely around the building thanks to specially designed power cells hidden within their frames. But when it comes time to introduce the characters, the tape mysteriously glitches out. Thinking nothing of it, Mike takes a security vest and goes out to explore the main room. The place looks empty at first, but that's when he hears a loud crash from up on the stage. Peeking behind the curtain, he sees the four animatronic characters all standing there motionless, although something about them doesn't seem quite right. After making his rounds, Mike goes back to his desk and quickly falls asleep. He finds himself back in the same dream as always, but this time there are five strange children standing behind him. Confused, he begins to ask if any of them saw the man who took his brother, but the kids immediately scatter in separate directions, and before he can catch them, he trips over a rock, jolting him awake on the floor of the security room. Checking his watch, he sees that it's already 6 a.m. He's survived his first night, but soon things are going to take an incredibly disturbing turn. On night two, Mike clocks in for another shift, but he falls asleep without noticing that Foxy is already on the move. He ends up having the same strange dream once again, except instead of going after the blonde boy, he decides to chase down this kid in the orange shirt instead. This time, Mike actually catches up to him, but the kid spins around and slashes his arm with a pirate hook, before screaming in his face as his eyes turn black. Back in reality, Mike jumps awake to find that the animatronics in the building are all going crazy, but quickly flips the breaker switch, returning things to normal for now. As he catches his breath, he notices a police officer at the front door trying to get in. The woman introduces herself as Vanessa and says that she stops in to check up on all of the new security guards, although none of them seem to last for more than a few nights. After helping Mike patch up his arm, she explains that the place got shut down when a bunch of local kids went missing back in the 80s, but doesn't give him any more details for now. Okay, listen up guys, and I do mean listen. Before we get too much farther into the video, I want to warn you about something terrifying happening. That's right, there's something earth-shatteringly scary happening before your very eyes and ears. I'm talking, of course, about people overpaying for low-quality earbuds. You could be listening to me break down surviving terrifying situations with something much better. I'm talking, of course, about Raycons. They have premium tech products at an incredible price and have made a name for themselves in premium audio quality with their everyday line of earbuds. I use these things pretty much everywhere, but their noise isolating feature is huge for me when I'm trying to focus up and figure out the best way to survive these situations. It's not just earbuds from Raycon though. They make a ton of cool stuff with thousands of five-star reviews that you'll definitely dig. Check out Raycon Home and Raycon PowerTech products, like the Magic 180 meter charging cable or the faucet filter. You also don't have to worry about dealing with horrifying crowds on Black Friday if you want to score a sweet deal on some of their products. There's an early Black Friday deal happening on their site with 20% off everything and 50% off select products. So get an early start on holiday sales by shopping Raycon's early Black Friday sale today. Go to buyraycon.com slash how to beat to get 20 to 50% off site wide. Okay, somebody needs to get this guy a Red Bull. Possessed animatronics aside, how the hell is he just gonna nod off to sleep while all alone and in a place like this? Trust me, I get the appeal of napping on company time, but in these circumstances, that's just asking for trouble. He may not be fully aware that these animatronics are out for blood yet, but regardless of that, we need to remember that he was specifically hired to work here because there's a high chance that dangerous people might try to break in in the middle of the night. So what does he think would happen if they showed up and caught him out cold? He could wake up in the morning missing a kidney, and compared to the real danger that's lurking up on stage, it's safe to say that he'd be getting off easy if that's all that happened. Imagine yourself in the same situation for a minute. Don't you think that you'd want to stay awake and alert for the first few nights until you were more comfortable with how the place worked? Or at the very least, make sure that all of the doors are locked up, especially the doors to his security room, before deciding to catch some Zs? That's not to mention that Mike was hearing things go bump in the night within just his first hour of being there. If there's not supposed to be anyone else inside, then what could be making those sounds? Best case scenario, it's rat. And worst case, well, you can let your imagination fill in the blanks. As Michael Scott once said, I'm not superstitious, but I'm, I am a little stitious. 
And that's why, if it were me, you wouldn't catch me letting my guard down in this place until I was absolutely positive that there was no chance of becoming Freddy Food. Speaking of animatronics trying to force you into a suit, if Mike here had been doing his job instead of sleeping on the clock, then he might have noticed that Foxy was missing. But as it stands, he still has no idea of the danger that he's really in. It's time to start catching on though, because somehow the cut from his dream actually happened in real life. And if that's not a red flag, then I don't know what is. After all, if there wasn't supposed to be anyone else in the building, then how could that have happened? The only ways to explain it are that somebody broke in and attacked him, or that something supernatural is going on. And neither answer is a good one. Either way, I'd be keeping the doors locked and the lights on in the security room next time, and most importantly of all, staying the hell awake until morning. Mike may be completely oblivious to anything that's going on, but Vanessa here seems to know a lot about the place, and just mentioned that a bunch of kids went missing there several years before. Kids like the one that suddenly started appearing in Mike's dreams on his very first night of working there. So yeah, call it a hunch, but it might be time to start looking into those disappearances before where Mike here ends up as the entertainment at a ghost kid's birthday party. You see, in his dream, four of the kids even have matching outfits that correspond exactly with each of the four animatronics. There's Bonnie's bunny ears, Foxy's pirate hook, Freddy's top hat, and Chica's bib. It doesn't take Scooby-Doo and the gang to figure out that the spirits of these kids and the animatronic characters are obviously connected somehow. But Mike here is either too exhausted or too downright dumb to pick up on the hints just yet. It's morning again, and as the two of them are heading home, Vanessa reassures Mike that if he just keeps his cool and does his job, then everything will be fine. They're not the only ones with an interest in Freddy's though. Hoping to get Mike fired, his Aunt Jane actually paid a group of troublemakers to trash the place. The moment that they're gone, this guy Jeff and his boys break in through the loading dock and quickly get to work. He orders them to split up, destroy whatever they can, and collect any valuables that they find, but none of them are going to leave this restaurant alive. This guy Carl starts crashing the kitchen when he finds a tiny Mr. Cupcake animatronic hiding out in the fridge, and it's staring right back at him. Suddenly, he's distracted by a loud crash, but when he turns around, the cupcake is gone. Turning back again, this time he sees Chica standing there with the cupcake on a plate, but before he can even react, the tiny animatronic lunges towards him, devouring his face while he's still alive. His buddy Hank comes to check out the commotion and instantly freaks out when he sees Chica standing there giving him a death stare. Panicking, Hank takes off running for his life, sprinting back through the halls until he finds a supply closet, but by then, it's already far too late. Bonnie is in there waiting for him, and he's powerless to fight back as the animatronic tears him to pieces, leaving only Jeff to go. When Jeff finally gets there, both of his boys are already done for, and he quickly realizes that he's about to be next. Terrified, he manages to make it back to the security room, only to notice that Bonnie and Chica are staring straight at one of the cameras. They release Mr. Cupcake into the air vents to finish him off, but Jeff catches onto their plan just in time, and is able to stop the Cupcake from getting in. It's a close call, but the animatronics aren't done with him yet. Just then, the door to the room opens on its own, and when Jeff decides to peek out into the hallway, it slams shut behind him, locking him out. The emergency exit is locked too, and that's when Foxy rushes towards him out of the darkness, brutally killing him just a few inches from safety. In a matter of moments, all three of these delinquents are killed, but there's still one more intruder left to go, and she's gonna have the most horrifying death of all. After a while, Mike's former babysitter comes in to see what's taking her brother and his friends so long. But by now, there's no trace of them anywhere to be found. As she enters the kitchen, a vision of the blonde kid opens a large metal door in the hallway behind her and tricks her into following him deeper into the building. At the end of the hall, she comes to an old workshop full of discarded animatronic parts, with Freddy himself standing there in the center of the room. The child's voice lures her closer and closer until suddenly, a ghost hand reaches out and pulls her into Freddy's mouth as his jaws forcefully snap shut, cutting her body Body completely in half. Okay, these douchebags totally deserved it, and it's good to see them get what they had coming, but that doesn't mean that we can't take a minute to learn from their mistakes. 
First of all, any self-respecting burglar always needs to have an exit strategy so that they can make a quick escape if and when the local authorities arrive on the scene. Although it's not exactly something that you'd be expecting to run into, this would also help out if the place that you're robbing happens to be haunted by giant animatronics that start trying to kill you in a brutal fashion. Now, uh, let's start with this guy, Carl, in the kitchen. This place is supposed to be empty except for him and his friends, so the moment that that I heard a strange noise coming from the shadows, I'd immediately grab a weapon first before going to check it out. Lucky for him, the kitchen is full of knives, pots, and pans that he might have been able to use to defend himself before he got turned into an idiot sandwich. It might not have done much against Chica, but one good swing with a frying pan would have sure sent Mr. Cupcake here flying across the room like a softball. For Chica herself, he could have tried drop kicking her back into the spinning fan blades on the wall to sever her head, or at least knock her off balance and give him a chance to escape. And when it comes to Hank the Tank here, we see a clear demonstration of why it's always important to have a well thought out exit strategy. Instead of running around like an animatronic chicken with its head cut off, he could have tried either quickly regrouping with Jeff and using his friend as a meat shield, or just going back out the way that they came in, anything but picking some random storage closet at the end of a dark hallway and hoping that hiding from these kid-friendly killing machines was actually going to work out. These must be some kind of pacifist criminal too, because just like the first guy, once Hank here was cornered, he didn't even try to fight back. He was clearly wielding a baseball bat when they first got there, and although he seemed to have lost it somewhere along the way, I'm positive that the storage closet would have at least had some tools or cleaning supplies that he could have used to fight back if he'd only reacted more quickly. Like for example, he could have easily toppled over one of the shelves to knock Bonnie off balance, and then used some extension cords or a crap ton of duct tape to try and restrain the robot before he got back up. You only have to look at their leader to see where these guys got their fighting skills from. Jeff here dropped his only weapon the instant that he saw Bonnie coming, and I get that it must have been a terrifying sight to see, but a crowbar is actually a great robot fighting weapon in the right hands. He could have barricaded himself in the security room and tried to hold out until the characters needed to recharge, or until Mike came back that night and then used him as a distraction while he made his escape. Mr. Cupcake coming after him through the vents would have made anyone soil their trousers. But where Jeff here sees danger, I see an opportunity. But instead of keeping the cupcake out, I might have let that little homicidal pastry in, and here's why. Out of all the characters, the cupcake here is going to be the easiest one to take on in a fight. And if I could defeat him in single combat, I might be able to hold him hostage and use his life as a bargaining chip threatening to finish him off for good unless the others let me leave in one piece. It's a long shot, but desperate times call for desperate measures. And in a situation like this, you need to take advantage of any opportunity that you have. Which brings us to Max, the babysitter here. Her death might have been the most horrific, but it was also the most avoidable. This should go without saying, but you never, and I mean never, follow a creepy kid down a dark hallway. That's basic survival 101, lady, and definitely don't stick your head directly inside of a creepy old animatronic's mouth. Unless your goal is to be remembered as the most idiotic person who was ever killed by Freddy and his friends. It's safe to say that this town doesn't produce the smartest criminals in the world, and let's just hope that Mike here can figure out what's really going on before he ends up sharing the same fate. That night, Mike can't seem to reach his babysitter on the phone, leaving him with no choice but to bring Abby along to work. They notice right away that the place is completely destroyed, so Mike puts Abby to bed in his office and starts cleaning up. After finally getting the mess sorted out, he puts on his headphones and quickly drifts off to sleep. This time, he tries asking the blonde boy for help finding his brother's kidnapper, promising that he'll give him and his friends whatever they want in return. Just then, he hears a scream from out in the distance and the boy disappears into thin air, leaving behind a drawing of a rabbit in the dirt. Mike suddenly wakes up and that's when he hears Abby screaming for real. Panicking, he runs out into the main room where he finds his little sister completely surrounded by the massive animatronics. 
He grabs a chair and gets ready to fight for their lives, but at the last moment, Abby reveals that she's actually completely fine. It turns out that she's become friends with the characters, although Mike still isn't sure if they can be trusted, or how this can even be possible. Nervously, he tells Abby that it's time for them to go home. She decides to give Freddy a goodbye hug, and although he could have easily snapped her spine like a toothpick, he lets the girl go without any trouble. Back at the house, Mike here makes a game-changing discovery. After tucking her into bed, he realizes that all the kids in Abby's drawings are the same ones that he's been seeing in his dream. In the morning, he asks her to tell him about her new friends, and what she says leaves him shocked. According to his little sister, the animatronics are actually possessed by the spirits of missing children. The blonde one even told her about what happened to Garrett, although he never said anything about the man who was driving the car. What the kid does like to talk about is a big yellow rabbit, and soon they're going to find out why. Whew, okay, that was a close call. Mike here finally knows that the ghosts of dead children are actually haunting the animatronics themselves. And he has a really tough choice to make for what to do next. A normal person would just stop showing up to work at this point, but he's convinced that they can somehow tell him what happened to his missing younger brother. So Mike isn't ready to give up just yet. However, we've seen what these things are really capable of, so he needs to be careful with his approach. The animatronics don't seem to like adults very much, but they do get along with Abby, so Mike needs to use this to his advantage. He could start by asking her to find out what each of the kids likes such as their favorite toys from when they were still alive, and then bringing them each a gift to earn their trust. Since the blonde kid won't say anything about his brother, he could try asking him about the yellow rabbit instead, and see where that information leads. It might even be possible for Mike to dress up like an animatronic character himself to see if that helps get them talking. Of course, Mike's best bet is to keep things friendly while the characters still show no signs of being hostile. But from the way that Freddy was looking at him, there's a good chance that he might end up having to fight, and if it were me, I wouldn't go back there without a plan to kill these cartoonish Terminators if that's what it came down to. One look at these things should tell you that they're most likely going to be impervious to standard damage, but Fear not, because they can still be defeated. We're just gonna have to get creative. Being animatronics, we know that they're mostly made of fabric and rubber on the outside, with electrical wiring and a metal endoskeleton to give them power and support underneath. This means that covering them with water might potentially fry their circuits, and setting them on fire could melt off their outer layers as well as any electrical components found within. If you prefer to go with good old fashioned brute force, then I'd suggest taking them apart one piece at a time by using something powerful like a fire axe or a sledgehammer, and specifically targeting their joints as weak points starting with the legs to hopefully compromise their mobility. In order to attack you, they need to be able to see you first, so I'd also target their eyes, and either try to damage them with a weapon or spray them down with something like the foam from a nearby fire extinguisher to blind them, even if the effect was only temporary. Use your superior agility to stay out of range while focusing most of your attacks on their vulnerable areas, and you just might survive the battle. We're gonna need to use every advantage that we have here, and although it'd be risky since they seem to trust Abby, she could be used to lure them into a trap, or just lock them inside one of the back rooms. In fact, it might be possible to avoid confrontation altogether by going after the animatronic's power source instead. According to that welcome video that Mike watched on night one, the characters are powered by rechargeable batteries, so if he could figure out where they're charging up from, he might be able to damage the system so that they'd have no more power once their cells run out. Also, there's a breaker switch located inside of the security room that seems to control all of the power to the entire building, so I'd try just leaving it shut off and bringing my own battery-powered lights to brighten this place up. This would leave him without access to the cameras, but he could still pour bags of flour from the kitchen all over the stage and hallways. That way, he'd be able to know if the animatronics were still moving around or not. There's always the chance that taking away their electricity won't have any effect at all since they're possessed by children's spirits, but it's a place to start and definitely worth a try. 
If all else fails, then they could always try bringing in a priest to do an exorcism on the suits, because sometimes when you're dealing with the vengeful spirits of the dead, your only choice is to call in an expert. Despite everything that's happened, Mike still doesn't realize how dangerous this situation could get, but pretty soon, he's gonna find out the hard way. When Mike and Abby arrive at the restaurant later that night, they notice that Vanessa has already beaten them there. Mike finally realizes that she's been friends with the possessed animatronics all along, and tonight it looks like they started the party early. For now, the characters are all playing nice, but it won't be long before that changes. While Vanessa and Mike go to get some supplies out of a storage closet, he almost puts his hand inside of a broken down spring lock suit. Lucky for Mike, she stops him just in time, explaining that these types of characters were designed so that a person could control it from inside, but the older that they got, there was a chance that they could malfunction and kill the user. As they walk back out into the main room, they see Abby dancing with the animatronics, and that's when disaster strikes. Vanessa tries to stop her from getting too close to Bonnie's guitar, but it's too late, and when she reaches out to touch it, she's suddenly struck with a huge burst of electricity, sending her flying off of the stage and down to the floor. Fortunately, the girl survives relatively unharmed, but Vanessa has officially decided that Freddy's is no longer a safe place for a little kid. Kid. Outside, she tells Mike to just take Abby home early and threatens to shoot him if he ever brings her back there again. Without a babysitter, he's got no one to watch Abby while he's at work, but Mike also can't afford to lose this job. This forces him to call in help from the last person who the girl wants to see. In the morning, Abby wakes up to find her evil aunt Jane sitting there in the kitchen, and she is not happy to see her. Mike here called the woman over to babysit while he goes off on a secret mission of his own, but what he doesn't realize is that now that the spirits of the children have taken a liking to her, the restaurant isn't the only place where his sister is in danger. Determined to finally find some answers, Mike heads back to Freddy's and forces himself to sleep. Within moments, he's back in the same dream once again, but this time he senses that things are somehow different than he remembers. Instead of watching his brother be taken away, he finds his family playing happily together as if the tragedy never happened. That's when the blonde boy and his friends appear behind him, promising Mark that this can all be real for a price. They'll give him dreams of his family being together every night and finally allow him to be with his little brother again, but he has to give them Abby in exchange. Mike hesitates at first, but when the visions of his family convince him that Abby would be better off with the other kids, he finally caves to the pressure and decides to make the deal. It's a bad choice, and it only takes him a moment to realize that he's made a mistake, but by then, it's already too late. When he turns around, the creepy kids and his family have all disappeared, leaving him completely alone in his nightmare. Suddenly, the kids begin rushing in from behind and slashing at Mike over and over again, before just as quickly disappearing out of sight until he's finally too injured and overwhelmed to fight back. There's one kid who's no longer with them, though, the blonde-haired boy, because he's gone off to claim Abby and make her become one of them. Okay, this guy just made the worst mistake possible. Remember before when you told Vanessa that finding the guy who took your brother was the only thing that mattered to you? Yeah, I bet you're regretting that choice of words now, aren't you, Mike? I was rooting for you, man, but Mike, you f***ed up. I'll keep this one short and sweet. This whole thing started because you were so busy sleeping on the job while trying to find clues about your brother, who's been missing for two decades, that you left your poor little sister, who's very much still alive by the way, to be messed with by a bunch of ghost kids in a creepy old abandoned Chuck E. Cheese ripoff. That doesn't exactly make you brother of the year material, I'm sorry to say. Putting the haunted-ass animatronics aside, did you somehow forget that you were hired to work here specifically because the place has problems with real-life criminals breaking in during the middle of the night? It's not exactly the best place for a kid, and definitely not the kind of place where you leave a 10-year-old girl to fend for herself while you catch up on some sleep. She could have easily been kidnapped or killed too, and then you'd have no brother or sister, and this time you'd be the only one to blame. I get that you want to know what happened to Garrett, but that doesn't mean that you can just stop thinking about the safety of your only family member who's still alive. Worst of all, in your moment of weakness, you gave the spirit children exactly what they wanted, and anyone with two brain cells to rub together knows that you'd never ever do that. 
no matter how much you miss your little brother. Hopefully you can still set things right before it's too late, but when your desperate search for closure ends with your younger sister about to be killed by a band of possessed robots, Mike, you f***ed up. Mike finally wakes up to discover that he's been strapped into a chair with an old Freddy mask full of sharp spinning gears slowly descending towards his face. At the last second, he's able to pull a pin out of the restraints and unlock the machine, setting himself free. But he's not out of the danger zone just yet. As he looks around, he's horrified to see the bodies of the babysitter and her friends are all scattered around the room. And that's when he realizes that the animatronics are secretly out for blood. Panicking, he sprints out of the room and makes a break for the exit door, but it's locked tight, and Foxy is closing in. Mike screams out terrified as the animatronic rushes towards him, and for now, it's unclear whether or not he managed to escape in time. Meanwhile, back at the house, Aunt Jane is about to meet her end. She's busy watching TV, smugly thinking that she's going to get Mike to sign over the custody papers, when suddenly she's killed by a massive Golden Freddy animatronic that's been possessed by the spirit of the blonde boy. Hearing the thud, Abby comes out of her room to see what happened, and a vision of the kid tells her that she can now finally come play with him and the others. Abby here is just happy to see her friends again, and climbs into a cab along alongside Golden Freddy to head back to the restaurant without giving it a second thought, never suspecting that she's actually in serious danger. This time, Mike wakes up on a stretcher and realizes that Vanessa here saved his life seconds before he would have been killed by Foxy. Although he should be grateful, he's furious at her for not telling him that the animatronics were dangerous, when she clearly knew all along what was really going on. After telling her what happened in his most recent dream, Vanessa explains that the spirits of the children are trying to take Abby so that they can make her one of them. According to Vanessa, after the children went missing back in the day, the police could never find any trace of them no matter how hard they searched. That's because the owner of the restaurant hid their bodies in one place that he knew nobody would ever look, within the animatronics themselves. Somehow, the man still holds power over the children's spirits and forces them to commit these evil acts against their own will. When Mike asks her how she knows so much about them, Vanessa here reveals the shocking truth. The killer was actually her father, William Afton, who took the children while wearing his giant yellow rabbit suit. Although she didn't know it until after they'd met, he's also the one who really took Garrett back at the campground. Determined not to lose another sibling to this psycho, Mike decides that it's time to fight back and asks Vanessa what he can do to save his sister before it's too late. She explains that he can briefly stun the animatronics by overloading their circuits with electricity using tasers and cattle prods. And although this won't take them down forever, it should buy him enough time to get Abby and escape. As he's getting ready to leave, Mike asks Vanessa to come as backup, but she insists that she can't fight her father if he's there, forcing him to go alone. Okay, this is about to get interesting. Mike's been given a good place to start now that he knows that he can stun the characters with electricity, but if he's going to save his sister, then it might be necessary to take them down for good. Out of the two weapons that he's got, the taser packs much more of a punch than the cattle prod, with the main disadvantage being that he'll have to reload the cartridge after each shot. According to Vanessa though, the cattle prods are still powerful enough to take the animatronics down, at least for a short window. With this in mind, I'd start out using the cattle prod as my primary weapon and then hitting them with the taser once they were already stunned just for good measure. Since it might be enough to completely overload their circuits and there'd be no chance of it accidentally missing the target. Now tasers are great and all, but why stop there? Since they were in a police station just now, I'd have tried to at least get my hands on a shotgun some flares, stun grenades, or even some SWAT armor if I could, anything that might give me an advantage in the fight. However he's able to do it, once the animatronics are down, it might be a good idea to try taking them apart with tools while they're incapacitated. I mean, not only would this stop them from being able to come after him again, but he might even be able to get the kids' bodies out of the machines, return them to their families, and give them a proper burial. With any luck, this would finally put their spirits to rest and lift the possession once and for all. Of course, the main focus here is getting Abby out, not fighting, so Mike's safest choice is to be as stealthy as he can and avoid confrontation altogether, or pick them off one at a time if he has to get physical. 
he'll also want to make sure that he has an escape route planned out ahead of time. That one exit door that keeps getting stuck apparently opens from the outside, so I'd try blocking it open before going in. That way, he'd have a clear route to freedom once he found Abby. This isn't going to be easy, but if he plays his cards right, Mike just might be able to save his sister in time. Instead of using the front door, Mike sneaks into the building through the ventilation shafts, managing to avoid being spotted for now. Inside, he sees Abby on the stage with the other characters, but she's quickly led away by Chica deeper into the back halls. Time is running out, but he'll have to deal with Freddy and Bonnie before going any further. After sneaking over to the stage, Mike dumps a bucket full of water at the animatronic's feet and fires his taser into it. Sure enough, the burst of electricity overloads their circuits, stunning the two characters and taking them out of the fight. But that's when he hears Abby scream from somewhere deeper inside. Rushing over to the source of the noise, Mike breaks into the storage room just as Chica is trying to force Abby into one of the spring lock suits. He quickly fires another taser right into the robot's eyeball, dropping her flat on the spot and saving Abby in the nick of time, but they aren't safe just yet. As the two of them are running for the exit, Mike is suddenly taken down by Mr. Cupcake, latching onto his leg, sacrificing himself so that she can get away. He tells Abby to make a break for it while he fights for his life, but there's still one more animatronic lurking in the shadows. While Mike manages to take Mr. Cupcake out with his cattle prod, Foxy emerges from behind the curtain and begins stalking Abby through the arcade. Thinking quickly, she decides to take cover in a ball pit, but she can't stay hidden forever. Just when it looks like Foxy is about to sniff her out, Vanessa swoops in and zaps him full of electricity, saving Abby from a horrible death. Injured but still alive, Mike limps back into the main room in search of his sister, when suddenly he sees the yellow rabbit appear from out of the darkness. The suit is massive, and when Mike fires one of his tasers into its chest, it only laughs in his face before shoving him to the ground. The rabbit stands over Mike, taunting him, delighted that he's going to get to kill him now after having killed his younger brother all those years ago. After waking up the rest of the animatronics, he stands over Mike wielding a huge knife and is about to finish the job, when all of a sudden, Vanessa orders him to put the weapon down. Laughing, the rabbit takes off his mask, revealing that it's William Afton himself wearing the suit, and he's the same career counselor who convinced Mike to take the job in the first place. With no other choice, Vanessa fires a round into his chest, but the suit deflects the bullet, leaving him completely unharmed. Okay, this is crazy. Shaggy here just showed up wearing a full suit of animatronic armor and even bullets don't seem to work, so what can they do? Well, try aiming for the head instead of the body of the suit for one. I get that Vanessa here probably still doesn't want to off her dad even though he's literally a serial killer, so give Mike the gun and let him do it. Problem solved. In the days of plate armor, blunt weapons like maces and warhammers were used to damage the wearer without having to actually pierce through the suit. In this case, William is actually wearing one of the old Springlock models, which means that if they can cause enough damage to the suit itself, then the inner components should snap shut and kill him for you. The plan is simple. Find something heavy and swingable and keep wailing on him with it until he either gets a concussion or the suit tears him apart from the inside. Good luck, Mike. You're gonna need it. Using the strength provided by the suit, William easily overpowers Vanessa and pins her against an arcade machine, nearly choking her to death. That's when Mike realizes that their last chance is for Abby to show the other children what really happened and get them to turn against the killer. Realizing what she's doing, William decides to go after Abby instead. Vanessa tries to stop him, but he turns around and stabs her straight through the stomach. The sacrifice was worth it though, because Abby is able to draw a picture of the yellow rabbit killing the kids and pin it up on the wall just in time. Back in the security room, Mike flips the breaker, resetting all of the electronics in the building. After seeing Abby's drawing, the animatronics realize that the yellow rabbit is evil and direct their murderous rage towards him instead. With William blinded by the floodlights, Chica sends Mr. Cupcake to take a bite out of his suit. The attack damages the inner mechanisms, causing the spring locks to suddenly snap shut, piercing Afton's chest. As he collapses to the floor, he places the mask back over his head 
head, threatening that he'll be back before finally succumbing to his injuries. With Afton down, the animatronics take him and drag him off deeper into the back halls, where Mike and Abby take Vanessa and rush out of the building as the entire place starts to fall apart. A few weeks later, Mike is still looking pretty beat up, but Abby has made a massive turnaround. She's eating and interacting with the other kids again, and Mike finally has the closure that he'd been searching for, giving him a chance to move on and start fresh. While driving home from school one day, they stop to visit Vanessa at the hospital. Although she's still unconscious, Mike thanks her for helping them, and promises that they'll be there for her when she wakes up. Back at Freddy's, the spirits of the kids leave a horrifically injured William somewhere in one of the back rooms, still wearing his yellow rabbit suit. For now, now, it looks like they have their revenge, until William finds a way to come back to haunt them once again. But what would you do if you got a job as an overnight security guard at an abandoned pizzeria and found out that weird was happening all the time? Would you just chalk it up to bumps in the night, or would you really be given the side eye to those animatronics? Let us know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How to Beat playlist for more videos just like this. Oh yeah, and have a damn good day.